Hi gang, dreadnoughts are one of the most distinctive things about the battlefields of Warhammer 40,000. Great hulking suits of armour, each one clad in slabs of ceramite and adamantium and bristling with weapons, and each an honoured relic, the final resting place of a heroic warrior. In 40k, dreadnoughts are an ancient technology, repurposed by the Imperium, but that comes at a cost, and it's possible they were never really intended to be around that long. So we've looked into the history of both power armor and terminator armor in game, and now it's the turn of what might be the oldest armor of all, dreadnought armor. And though it's not always phrased that way, it is a suit of armor of a sort. Often confused for robots or other automata, dreadnoughts are huge fighting machines standing two to three times the height of a man, pushed forward by articulated limbs and powerful fiber bundles, bristling with weaponry, and piloted by a venerable hero, a warrior with centuries of experience of battle. The technology used in their construction has a lot of similarities to other technologies like power armor or terminator armor, but dreadnought technology is much older, and depending on how you look at it, it's either much more sophisticated or much, much cruder, since dreadnought suits take a much higher toll on their wearer. Dreadnoughts were a product of the Dark Age of Technology, that mythical period in the 20 something millenniums where humanity was at its technological peak, but the secrets of their construction were maintained throughout the following Age of Strife on both Mars and on Terra. When the Emperor fought his unification wars in the late 30th millennium, clanking proto-dreadnoughts were used by many of the factions, piloted then by regular human soldiers, but while they were a powerful force multiplier on the battlefield, there were downsides. Like all powered armor, the suits required a connection to the wearer's senses and nervous system, but the integration required by a dreadnought was much more invasive, the pilot crouching in a fetal position, suspended in amniotic jelly, and fed information from the suit's sensors via a direct spinal link. And that link was difficult to break. Once accustomed to the suit's senses, removal and readapting to normal life was difficult, often causing severe mental damage, and this damage only became worse as the suits themselves got larger and more sophisticated and took a heavier and heavier toll on the wearer. Because of this, as the Imperium grew, the use of dreadnoughts became confined to augmented warriors, whose bodies and minds could better deal with the stress of piloting them. Either the Space Marines of the Legiones Astartes, or the warriors of the Legio Custodes, and the practice became to never remove the occupier after their installation. Over time, this meant that internment inside a dreadnought chassis became a form of second life for grievously injured warriors. Soldiers whose bodies had suffered fatal injuries, but whose minds were still intact, could be permanently installed into a dreadnought frame, fighting on as venerable heroes who could continue to serve the Imperium long past the point of death. And it's this that defines dreadnoughts apart from other robotic walkers. At the core of each is a long dead veteran, the chassis as much a form of life support as it is a suit of battle armor. Installation is a painful and involved process. What little remains of the occupant after preparation, often just a torso and some vital organs, installed into a removable sarcophagus that bonds with the dreadnought systems, their brains wired into mind impulse pulse units that allow them to see and hear through the dreadnought's external optics and sensors. The stress on the minds of the occupants is still intense, and so only the most stable, stoic, and determined warriors are considered for internment, and it's common to keep dreadnoughts in stasis or otherwise slumbering whenever they're not required for battle. In that way, despite the toll on the wearer, Dreadnoughts can survive for thousands of years, roused at times of extreme necessity. But of course, by the 41st millennium, dreadnoughts are an ancient and barely understood technology for the space marine chapters that make use of them, revered as their art of construction has been all but lost. 
just like everything else. Their occupants are often veterans centuries old by that point, honoured ancients of the chapter to which they belong, and often treated as learned advisors as much as battle brothers. Their suits are outfitted with a range of weapons way too heavy for a normal marine to carry, often chosen based on the occupier's preferences in life, from close combat weapons like chain fists and power claws to an array of fire support options. These dreadnought armors are a marvel of lost technology, ridiculously durable and endlessly repaired by a chapter's tech marines. Their hulls are all but irreplaceable and carefully guarded by the chapter. If the sarcophagus is breached and the occupier lost, the Battle Brothers will fight till the last to retrieve the shell and the suit will be prepared for the next worthy candidate, however long it takes for one to turn up. As it is, by the 41st millennium, some dreadnought suits have been in continuous use by a chapter for over 10,000 years, filled with a roll call of ancient wounded heroes. Of course, over the 10,000 years of development, there have been many different variants of dreadnought armour, though unlike power and terminator armour, they don't really follow a simple pattern of improvement. Many of those designs just existed concurrently with each other. For much of the Imperium's existence, the most common form of dreadnought armour has been the Mark IV and Mark V Castroferum suit. Standing just under 4 metres tall and weighing around 12 tonnes, the suits are incredibly heavily armoured, particularly towards the front, and are powered by versatile thermic reactors. In front of this sits prominent sarcophagus sections to house the occupant. Both of these marks have been in common use since the Great Crusade, though the Mark IV suits tended to be more common with in the legions that sided with Horus during the heresy, which has given them something of an unfavourable reputation amongst loyalist chapters ever since. Both can be outfitted with a bewildering array of armaments, and many chapters have evolved their own unique versions. A standard dreadnought loadout tends to mirror that of a Space Marine officer, a close combat weapon, often a power fist or a chain fist, an arranged weapon system ranging from twin-linked heavy bolters through to assault cannon or multi-melters through to more exotic weaponry like a plasma cannon. But that's just the standard ones. Mortis dreadnoughts are fire support variants armed with multiple of the same weapon, often two twin-linked autocannons to serve as a form of anti-air platform. And the Hellfire dreadnought is another fire support option armed with twin LAS cannon and a missile launcher. On the flip side, assault dreadnoughts are relatively common, armed with twin close combat weapons, but more specialised are the ironclad and siege dreadnought patterns. Ironclad dreadnoughts are equipped with additional ablative armour and close assault weapons like hurricane bolters and assault launchers, whereas siege dreadnoughts are equipped with siege drills to bore their way through enemy fortifications and a flamestorm cannon to clear the occupants afterwards. If the occupant was formerly a chaplain or a librarian, their dreadnought suit might reflect that, armed with a crozius arcanum or force weapons, and individual chapters have customised suits further, from the Death Company and Furioso close combat dreadnoughts of the Blood Angels to the Doomglaive dreadnoughts of the Grey Knights, whose armour bears the same hexagramic wards as the rest of the chapter. But though these Castroferum suits are the most common sort, more advanced variants do or did exist. The Contemptor Pattern Dreadnought was a development of the Great Crusade. As the forces of the Imperium pushed out from terror, they recovered all manner of lost technologies, and these were incorporated into the Imperium's armies. Sharing many systems with the contemporaneous Mark IV Maximus Power Armor or Tartaros Terminator Armor, Contemptor Dreadnoughts were much larger faster and more durable than the previous marks, and became increasingly common amongst the Space Marine legions of the latter end of the Great Crusade. As well as more advanced armour weaves, the suits also incorporated atomantic field generators to better protect their occupants, and were powered by more complex atomantic power cores, both of which were technologies developed by the Mechanicum for use in Legio Cybernetica Automata. Standard armament was similar to the Castroferums, a close combat weapon and a ranged weapon, though Mortis variants did exist. More common though was the Derideo pattern dreadnought, a development of the Contemptor pattern that functioned as a heavy fire support platform, armed with colossal long-ranged weapon systems and advanced targeting arrays. 
And then towards the end of the Great Crusade, the legions were also bolstered by the Leviathan Siege Dreadnought, a colossal pattern developed initially in secret by the tech clans of Terra, away from the pervasive oversight of the Mechanicum, and its systems incorporated lost technologies held separate from Mars for hundreds of years. Designed originally to destroy buildings and fortifications, it was significantly larger even than Contempt Dreadnoughts and equipped with an oversized power core to allow the use of even bigger weaponry, though because of this, its systems were known to put significantly more strain on its occupants. All of these more advanced Crusade variants kind of fell out of use in the post-Heresy years, their systems being significantly more difficult to maintain, though some dreadnoughts of these marks still survive into the 41st millennium, as well as some even older variants. Records exist of a Lucifer pattern dreadnought, noted as being a particularly early and unhallowed variant with more dispersed armour than its contemporaries, the Castroferums, and the Furibundus class still exists in some, um, older forces, we'll say. And here, we're going to have to pause our in-world storytelling to take a look at the models, because the history of dreadnought sculpts doesn't quite match up as neatly as we'd like to those marks. Unlike with Power Armor, Dreadnought models have been through a number of changes that don't really visually match up with the laws, so let's briefly go through them. The first Dreadnoughts released were these in 1987, the infamous Ball Dreadnought, available with short or long legs and a thin or a wide body. They were nicknamed Chuck, Eddie and Fury, short for the three classes, the Contemptor, the Derrideo, and the Furibundus, each of which had just a different weapon loadout. There was also a Chaos Dreadnought in the same ball style with various mutations added on. So that was the original Dreadnought design as seen in Rogue Trader, but these designs were modified pretty quickly. By the release of Space Marine, Imperial Dreadnoughts now look like this, with a more humanoid shape, and the Chaos Dreadnoughts like this, the same style that was used in the Space Crusade board game. Then, just a couple of years later in the early 90s, with the release of Second Edition, the design changed again, to the familiar box Dreadnought shape, with Chaos receiving its own variant a few years later. This style of Dreadnought was maintained as just what Dreadnoughts looked like until the early 2000s, and the Horus Heresy card game. The Horus Heresy card game was the first time the heresy was really expanded beyond a few lines of text and a short story, and it required the creation of loads of art, which was later released as these Visions of Heresy books. And this art was the first time Games Workshop did something that is quite familiar today. They decided that the old model designs were in fact old designs in world as well. Those older games were mine to make the Horus Heresy look old too, and this design was then reclassified as what the Contemptor or Heresy or Dreadnought was. After all, the original Space Marine game was set in the Horus Heresy. When the 28mm Horus Heresy Age of Darkness tabletop game came out in 2012, this ramped up and Forge World folded even more of those old designs into the setting officially. Contempt to Dreadnoughts were released that looked like that epic dread, and the Derrideo was even reclassified as a kind of mix between a Contemptor and this old style Chaos Dreadnought. That process isn't complete though. We still don't officially know what the unhallowed Lucifer pattern looks like, and the Furibundus has never turned up again. But if you see these things walking around called Contemptors, or these ancient models used as Derrideos, well, yeah, that's why. Anyway, back to the lore. In the 10 millennia since the Horus Heresy, nothing really changed in the world of Dreadnought design until the late 41st millennium, when the Primaris Space Marines were revealed by Belisarius Call, alongside a whole suite of new equipment and vehicles. The Redemptor Dreadnought was part of this galaxy-wide upgrade, a significantly larger model of battlesuit, standing around as tall as a Leviathan Dreadnought, and designed to hold the remains of a Primaris Space Marine. This new frame featured all the upgrades invented by Call over his 10 millennia of research, though like that similarly sized Leviathan, it was noted as being particularly taxing for its operator, potentially burning through its pilots faster than the previous marks. And of course, as well as the by now standard close combat and heavy weapon combination, the Redemptor also came in Brutalis and Ballistus variants for assault and fire support. 
But the Space Marine chapters of the Imperium were never the only people to make use of Dreadnoughts. The Wars of the Horus Heresy saw many of the old legions fall to chaos, and Dreadnoughts remain common in the ranks of the traitors long after. Variants of the Castroferum and Contemptor designs continued to be used by heretic Astartes forces, though within the ranks of the Warbands their role as honoured advisors and ancients had largely been forgotten. Without the resources to properly maintain the chassis or prepare the pilot, it's almost inevitable that the occupants go slowly mad. Within the traitor legions, internment in a dreadnought is seen as a horrific punishment, an eternity locked in agony within a metal prison, and many chaos dreadnoughts are barely controllable on the battlefield, often held in chains, or powered down until the start of a battle before being loosed upon the enemy. Worse, deliberately possessed dreadnoughts are relatively common, from the castroferum based Hell Brutes to more specific variants, like the Mara Gal Dreadnought of the Word Bearers. And of course, even outside Astartes, the Legio and later Adeptus Custodes also make use of Dreadnought chassis, the enhanced biology of the Custodes making them prime candidates even for the more taxing chassis. Custodes Dreadnoughts tend to be of the Contemptor pattern, ancient venerable designs worked by the Emperor's own artificiers and incorporating advanced Auramite armour. As well as standard loadouts, the Custodes maintain their own patterns, armed similarly to their living warriors, the Achilles and Galatus Dreadnoughts, armed with a massive version of the Guardian Spear and a massive version of the Sentinel Blade and Shield. And finally, the Telemon Heavy Dreadnought is possibly one of the most sophisticated of them all. Used by the Custodes during the latter Great Crusade and the Horus Heresy, the Telemon is a huge construction, standing significantly taller than even a Leviathan, and apparently with certain plates of armour worked by the Emperor's own hand, which presumably was much easier during the Great Crusade. Amongst the elite of the 41st millennium, dreadnoughts are a vital tool. Mobile support platforms mixed with honoured and ancient warriors, they're a technology older than almost any other in the Imperium, a brutal reminder of the possibilities of the Dark Age of technology, refined and refined over at least 15,000 years, and, much like everything in the Imperium, a dwindling and barely understood resource. But still, they plod on through the battlefields of the 41st millennium, piloted by generation upon generation of warriors for whom entombment in a walking life support machine is either the greatest of honours or the most horrific of fates. Thanks for watching. And if you'd like to find out more about the equipment of the 41st millennium, well, there should be a video just coming up there on the right, and in the thing below, you'll find links to support the channel, including a Patreon with early access videos and Discord access. See ya!